All right. Let's get ready to do this. Excited to read this. Sweet, sweet. Oh, oops. Great. How do I get back to normal? So many. Okay. Nope. 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 <laughs> Where is it? Do I got an opening app? Yeah. One second. Please excuse the. Uh, Whatever this is. Let's see. That's better. Everything should be good. Hopefully the audio is working all right. Start in a minute. I'm excited to read this. I haven't read it in a while. I love this series. It's like a kind of a mix between real history, sort of, and fantasy. It's like set in like the Napoleon Bonaparte days. I will read the summary of the book before I actually start start into it. As you can see, the cover of the book and the bottom uh, where the chat books the chat box is at. This guy here. And uh, kind of throws you through the loop, loop at the beginning. It kind of jumps you right into the action. But I don't mind that. They try to try to quickly get you invested in what's going on. Looking around, making sure everything's set up. Oh, let's get this turned on. There we go. Yes. All right. I think I'm going to jump right into it. Um, let me read the summary of the book first before I forget. It'd be interesting reading. I could read the big thing on the screen. Reading it on the back of the books would be tough with this mask. <laughs> Aerial combat brings a thrilling new dimension to the Napoleonic Wars as uh, as valiant warriors rise to Britain's defense by taking to the skies. Not aboard aircraft, but atop the mighty backs of fighting dragons. When HMS Reliant captures a French frigate and seizes its precious cargo, an unhatched dragon egg. Uh, fate sweeps Captain Will Lawrence from his se seafaring life into the uncertain future and an unexpected kinship with the most extraordinary creature. Thrust into the rare, rarefied world of the aerial corpse as master of the dragon Temeraire, he will face a crash course in the daring tactics of airborne battle. For as France's own dragon-born forces rally to breach British soil in Bonaparte's boldest gambit, Lawrence and Temeraire must soar into their own baptism of fire. That's the brief summary. I haven't read her other stuff yet. This is the only thing I really know of her, but uh, these were great, the ones I have read. I have not read the whole series. There's like nine books. I think I read like three or four of them. I finally own the whole series, so I'm excited to deep, like, uh, dive right back into them.
Okay. Chapter one. The deck of a the deck of the French ship was slippery with blood, heaving in choppy sea. A stroke might as easily a stroke might as easily bring down the man making it as the intended target. Lawrence did not have time in the heat of battle to be surprised at the degree of resistance, but even through the numbing haze of battle fever and the confusion of swords and pistol smoke, he marked the extreme look of anguish on the French captain's face as the man shouted encouragements to his men. It was still there shortly thereafter, when they met on the deck, and the man surrendered his sword very reluctantly. At the last moment, his hand half-closed about the blade, as if he meant to draw it back. Lawrence looked up to make certain the colors had been stu- struck, then accepted the sword with a mute, bu- with a mute bow, not bow. He did not speak French, uh, being wait. He did not speak French himself, and a more formal exchange would have to, would have to wait for the presence of his third lieutenant. That young man being presently engaged below decks and securing the French guns, with the cessation of hostilities, the remaining Frenchmen were all virtually dropping where they stood. Lawrence noticed that there were fewer of them than he would have expected for a frigate of thirty-six guns, and that they looked ill and a hollow-cheeked. Many of them lay dead or dying upon the deck. He shook his head at the waist and eyed the French captain with disapproval. The man should never have offered battle, aside from the plain fact that the Reliant would have had the, uh, the amity. I don't know that word. I don't speak French. I think there's a few, if I remember correctly, there's a few uh, French words in this book that kind of throw me off sometimes. Um, I'll start that sentence over. So, aside from the plain fact that the Reliant would have had the amity slightly outgunned and outmanned under the best of circumstances. The crew had obviously been reduced by disease or hunger. To boot, the sails, ha- the sails above them were in a sad tangle, and that no result of the battle but of the storm which had passed but, uh, but this morning. They had barely managed to bring off a single broadside before the Reliant had closed and boarded. The captain was obviously deeply overset by the defeat, but he was not a young man to be carried away by his spirits. He ought to have done better by his men than to bring them into a so hopeless an action. Mr. Riley, Lawrence said, catching his second lieutenant's attention, have our men carry have our men carry the wounded below. He hooked the captain's sword on his belt. He did not think the man deserved the compliment of having it returned to him, though ordinarily he would have done so, and passed the word for Mrs. Mr. Wells or Mrs. Very good, sir, Riley said, turning to issue the necessary orders. Lawrence stepped to the railing to look down and see what damage the hole had taken. She looked reasonably intact, and he had ordered his own men to avoid shots um, below the waterline. He thought with satisfaction that there would be no difficulty in bringing her into port. His hair had slipped out of his short queue and now fell into his eyes as he looked over. He impatiently pushed it out of his way, out of the way, as he turned back, leaving streaks of blood upon his forehead and the sun-bleached hair. I think my mouse is in the way. This, with his broad shoulders and his severe look, gave him an unconsciously savage appearance as he surveyed his prize, very unlike his usual thoughtful expression. So I'm skipping my words a little bit here and there, but uh, I'm getting used to reading with the mask on. Bear with me. Wells climbed up from below in response to the summons and came to his uh, uh, to his side. Sir, he said, without waiting to be addressed, Begging your pardon, but Lieutenant Gibbs says there is something uh, queer in the hold. Oh, I will go and look, Lawrence said. Pray tell this gentleman, he indicated the French captain, that he must give me his parole for himself and his men, or they must be confined. The French captain did not immediately respond. He looked at his men with a miserable expression. They would, of course, do much better if they could be kept spread out through the lower deck, and any recapture was a practical impossibility under the circumstances. Still he hesitated, drooped, and finally hussed. Jamie Renz, with a look still more wretched. Lawrence gave a short nod. He may go to his cabin, he told Wells and turned to step down into the hold. Tom, will you come along? Very good. He descended with Riley on his heels and found his first lieutenant waiting for him. Gibbs' round face was still shining with sweat and emotion. One sec. Okay. 
He would be taking the prize into port. And as she was a frigate, he almost certainly would be made post, a captain himself. Lawrence was only mildly pleased, though. Or, only mildly pleased, though Gibbs had done his duty reasonably. The man had been imposed on him by the admiralty, and they had not become in, intim, intimates. About to say inmates. He had wanted Riley in the first lieutenant's place, and if he had been given his way, Riley would now be one of the be the one getting his step. That was the nature of the service, and he did not begrudge Gibbs the good fortune. Still, he did not rejoice quite so wholeheartedly as he would have, or uh, as he would have to see Tom get his own ship. Very well. What's all this then? Lawrence said. Now the hands were clustered about an oddly placed bulkhead towards the stern area of the hold. Neglected the work of cataloging the captured ship's stores. Sir, if you will step this way, Gibbs said. Make way there, he ordered. And the hands backed away from from what Lawrence now saw was a doorway set inside a wall that had been built across the back of the hold. Recently, for the lumber was marked, markedly lighter than the surrounding planks. Ducking through the low door, he found himself in a small chamber with a strange appearance. The walls had been reinforced with actual metal, which must have added a great deal of unnecessary weight to the ship. And the floor was padded with an old sailcloth, in addition, there was a small coal stove in the corner. Though this was not presently in use, the only object stored within the room was a large crate, roughly the height of a man's waist, and as wide, or, and as wide. And this was made fast to the floor and walls by means of thick hawsers attached to metal rings. Lawrence could not help feeling the liveliest curiosity, and after a moment's struggle, he yielded to it. Mr. Gibbs, I think we shall have a look inside, he said, stepping out of the way. The top of the crate was thoroughly nailed down, but eventually yielded to many willing hands. They pried it off and lifted out the top layer of packing, and many heads craned forward to the same time to see, or at the same time to see. No one spoke, and in silence Lawrence stared at the shining curve of eggshell rising out of the heap of straw. It was scarcely possible to believe. Pass the word to, or for Mr. Pollitt. He said at last. His voice sounded only a little strained. Mr. Riley, pray be sure those lashings are quite secure. Riley did not. Yeah, Riley did not immediately answer. Too busy staring. Then he jerked to attention and said hastily, "Yes, sir," and bent to the check the bindings. Lawrence stepped closer and gazed down on the egg. There could hardly be any doubt as to its nature, though he could not say for sure from his own experience. The first amazement passing. He tentatively reached out and touched the surface, very cautiously. It was smooth and hard to the touch. He withdrew almost at once, not wanting to risk doing it some harm. Mr. Pollitt came down into the hold in his awkward way, clinging to ladder edges with both hands and leaving bloody prints upon it. He was no kind of sailor, having become a naval surgeon only at the late age of 30. After some unspecified disappointments on land, he was nevertheless a geni genial man, well, or well liked by the crew, even if his hand was not always the steadiest at the operating table. Yes, sir, he said, then saw the egg. Good Lord above. Is it a dragon egg, then? Lawrence said. It required an effort to restrain the triumph in his voice. Oh, yes, indeed, Captain. The size alone shows that. Mr. Pollitt had wiped his hands on his apron and was already brushing more straw away from the top, trying to see the extent. My, it is quite hardened already. I wonder what they... I wonder what they can have been thinking so far from land. This did not sound very promising. Hardened? Lawrence said sharply. What does that mean? Why, that it will hatch soon. I will have to consult my books to be certain, but I believe that Bad Key's bestiary states the authority that when the shell has fully hardened, hatching will occur within a week. What a splendid specimen. I must get my measuring cords. He bustled away. And Lawrence exchanged a glance with Gibbs and Riley, moving closer so they might speak without being overheard by the lingering gawkers. At least three weeks from Madeira, with a fair wind, would you say? Lawrence said quietly. At best, sir, Gibbs said, nodding. I cannot imagine how they, would, how they came to be here with it, Riley said. What do you mean to do, sir? 
His initial satisfaction turned in gradually into dismay as he realized the very difficult situation. Lawrence stared at the egg blankly. Even in a dim lantern light, it shone with the warm luster of marble. Oh, I am damned if I know. Tom. <laughs> but I suppose I will go and return the French captain his sword. It is no wonder he fought so furiously after all. Except, of course, he did know. There was only one possible solution, unpleasant as it might be to contemplate. Lawrence watched broodingly while the egg was transferred, still in its crate, over to the Reliant. The only, gr the only grim man, except for the French officers. He had granted them liberty of the quarterback. Quarterdeck. Quarterback? I'm thinking football. Liberty of the quarterdeck. And they watched the slow process glumly uh, from the rail. All around them, smiles wreathed every sailor's face. Private gloating smiles, and there was a great deal of jostling among the idle hands, with many unnecessary cautions and pieces of the advice of advice called out to the sweating groups of men engaged in the actual business of the transfer. Uh, one second, let me check something real quick. Something seems off. Oops. Um, okay, never mind. I'm all good. What was I? Okay, cool. Sorry. The egg being safely deposited on the deck of the Reliant, Lawrence took his own leave of Gibbs. I will leave the prisoners with you. There is no sense in giving them a motive for some desperate attempt to recapture the egg, he said. Keep in company as well as you can. However, if we are separated, we will rendezvous at Madeira. You have my most hearty congratulations, Captain, he added, shaking Gibbs's hand. Oh. Thank you, sir. And may I say, I am most sensible, very grateful. But here Gibbs's eloquence, never in great supply, failed him. He gave up and merely stood beaming widely on Lawrence and all the world, full of great goodwill. The ships had been brought, up, brought abreast for the transfer of the crate. Lawrence did not have to take a, take a boat, but only sprang across on the uproll of the swell. Riley and the rest of his officers had already crossed back. He gave the order to make sail and went directly below to wrestle with the problem in privacy. Oops, back. Okay. But no, no, but no obliging alternative presented itself overnight. The next morning, he bowed to necessity and gave his orders. And shortly, the midshipmen and lieutenants of the ship came crowding into his cabin, scrubbed and nervous in their best gear. This sort of mass summons was unprecedented. And the cabin was not quite large enough to hold them all comfortably. Lawrence saw anxious looks on many faces, undoubtedly conscious of some private guilt, curiosity on others. Riley alone looked worried, perhaps suspecting of something of Lawrence's intentions. Lawrence cleared his throat. He was already standing, having ordered his desk and chair removed to make more room, though he had kept back his inkstand and pen with several sheets of paper. Now resting upon the sill of the stern window beside him, Gentlemen, he said, you have all heard by now that we found a dragon egg aboard the prize. Mr. Pollitt has very firmly identified it, identified it for us. Many smiles and some surreptitious elbowing, the little midshipman, little midshipman Battersea piped up in his treble voice. Congratulations, sir, and a quick pleased rumble went around. Lawrence frowned. He understood their high spirits, and if the circumstances had been only a little different, he would have shared them. The egg would be worth a thousand times its weight in gold. Brought safely to shore, every man aboard the ship would have shared in the bounty and as captain he himself would have taken the largest share of the value. The Amity's logs had been thrown overboard, but their hands had been less discreet than their officers. And Wells had learned enough from their, comp uh, from their complaints to explain the delay all too clearly. Fever among the crew, becalmed in their doldrums for the better part of a month, a leak in their water tanks leaving her on short water rations. And then... At last, the gale that they themselves had so recently weathered. It had been a string of exceptionally bad luck, and Lawrence knew the superstitious souls of his men would quail at the idea that the Reliant was now carrying the egg that had undoubtedly been the cause of it. Ooh. Sorry, excuse me. He would certainly take care to keep that information from his crew. However, better by far that they not know of the long series of disasters which the Amity had suffered. So after silence fell again. 
All Lawrence said was, sim- was simply, Unfortunately, the prize had a very bad crossing of it. She must have expected to make landfall nearly a month ago, if not more, and the delay has made the circumstances surrounding the egg urgent. There was a puzzlement and an incomprehension now on most faces, though looks of concern were beginning to spread, and he finished the matter off by saying, In short, gentlemen, it is about to hatch. <laughs> no. Can you imagine just you're already just having a string of bad luck? You think it's good, you got a dragon egg, sell it for money, but you find out it's about to hatch while you're still in the middle, like at sea. You don't really know anything about dragons, except that they're dangerous. <laughs> so I'm just picturing how it's all starting to click in their head right now. Another low murmur, this time disappointed, even a, even a few quiet groans. Ordinarily, he would have marked the offenders for a mile later re- rebuke, but as it was, he let them by. They would soon have more cause to groan. So far, they had not yet understood what it meant. They merely made the mental reduction of the bounty on the unhashed egg, so that paid for a... F- Wait, sorry, let me repeat that again. So far, they had not yet understood what it meant. They merely made the mental reduction of the bounty on an unhatched egg, to that paid for a feral dragonette, much less valuable. Okay, so now, I guess, at the moment, they're just kind of thinking, a baby dragon is uh, not worth as much as the actual egg itself. Okay. Perhaps not all of you are aware, he said, silencing the whispers with a look, that England is in a very dire situation as regards to the aerial corps. Naturally, our handling is superior, and the corps can outfly any other nation of the world. But the French can outbreed us two to one, and it is impossible to deny that they have better variety in their bloodlines. A properly harnessed dragon is worth at least the first rate of 100 guns to us. Even a common yellow reaper or a three-ton Winchester. And Mr. Pollitt believes, from the size and color of the egg, that this hatchling is a prime specimen, and very likely one of the rare large breeds. Oh, said Midshipman Carver, in tones of horror. As he took Lawrence's meaning, he instantly went crimson as the eyes went to him and shut his mouth tight. Lawrence ignored the interruption. Riley would see Carver's grog stop for a week without having to be told. The explanation had at least prepared the others. We must at least make the attempt to harness the beast, he said. I trust, gentlemen, that there is no man here who is not prepared to do his duty for England. The corpse may not be the sort of life that any of us has been raised to, but the Navy is no sinecure either. If I pronounce that right. (laughs) And there is not one of you who does not understand a hard service. Sir, said Lieutenant Fanshaw anxiously, he was a young man of a very good family, the son of an earl. Do you mean, that is, shall we all? (laughs) There was an emphasis on that all, which made it obviously a selfish suggestion. And Lawrence, Lawrence felt himself go near purple with anger. He snapped, We all shall, indeed, Mr. Fonshaw, unless there is any man here who is too much of a coward to make the attempt. And in that case, that gentleman may explain himself to a court-martial when we put, when we put in at Madeira. He sent an angry glare around the room, and no one else met his eye or offered a protest. He was all the more infuriated for understanding the sentiment and for sharing it himself. Certainly no man not raised to the life could not raise to the life could be easy at the prospect of suddenly becoming an aviator, and he loathed the necessity of asking his officers to face it. It meant, after all, an end to, a, to any semblance of ordinary life. It was not like sailing, where you might hand your ship back to the Navy and be set ashore, often whether you liked it or not. Even in times of peace, a dragon could not be put, put into dock, nor allowed to wander loose and to keep a full-grown beast of 20 tons from doing exactly as it pleased took very nearly the full attention of an aviator and crew of assistance, assistance besides. They could not really be managed by force and were finicky about their handlers. Some would not accept management at all, even when new hashed, and none would accept it after their first feeding. A feral dragon could be kept in the breeding grounds by the constant provision of food, mates, and comfortable shelter, but it could not be controlled outside, and it would not speak with men. So if a hatchling let you put it into harness, duty forever after tied you to the beast. An aviator could not easily manage any sort of estate, nor raise a family, nor go into society to any real extent. They lived as men apart, and largely outside the law. For you could not punish an aviator without losing the use of his dragon. 
In peacetime, they lived in a sort of wild, outrageous liber libertinage in small enclaves, generally in the most remote and inhospitable places in all of Britain, where the dragons would be given at least some freedom, though the men of the corpse were honored. Or, though the men of the corps were honored without question for their courage and devotion to duty, the prospect of entering their ranks could not be appealing to any gentleman raised up in respectable society. Yet they sprang from good families, gentlemen's sons handed over at the age of seven to be raised in the life, or raised to the life, and it would be impossible insult to the corps to have anyone other than one of his own officers attempt the harnessing. And if one had to be asked to take the risk, then all, then all, Though if Fanshawe had not spoken in so unbecoming a way, Lawrence would have liked to keep Carver out of it, as he knew the boy had poor head for height, poor head for heights, which struck him a, as a grave imped, impediment for an aviator. But in the atmosphere created by the pitiful request, it would seem like favoritism, and that would not do. He took a deep breath, still simmering with anger. Oops. He took a deep breath, still simmering with anger, and spoke again. No man here has any training for the task, and the only fair means of assigning the duty is by lot. Naturally, those gentlemen with family are excused. Mr. Pollitt, he said, turning to the surgeon who had a wife and four children in Derbyshire, I hope that you will draw the name for us. Gentlemen, you will each write your name upon a sheet here, and cast it into this bag. He suited word to deed, tore off the part of the sheet with his own name, folded it, and put it into the small sack. Riley stepped forward at once, and then the others followed suit obediently. Under Lawrence's cold eye, Fanshawe flushed and wrote his name with a shaking hand. Carver, on the other hand, wrote bravely, though with pale cheek, and at, at the last Battersea, unlike virtually all the others, was inca incautious in tearing the sheet, so that his piece was unusually large. He could be heard murmuring quietly to Carver, would it not be a famous or would it would it not be famous to ride a dragon? So he wants the job. Lawrence shook his head a little at the thoughtlessness of youth, yet it might indeed be better were one of the younger men chosen, for the adjustment would be easier. Still, it would be hard to see one of the boys sacrificed to the task, and to face the out, out, outrage of his family. But the same would be true of any man here, including myself. One sec. Okay, I should be good. For a second, I thought I forgot to unmute, unmute my audio, and that would have been bad. <laughs> that would have been really bad at this point in this dream. Okay, where, where did I leave off? Um, let's see, where, where, did I, where did I leave off? <laughs> um, I think I left off here, though he had done his best. I'm going to... If I didn't leave off there and I already read that part, forgive me, but I'm going to go right back to it. I got distracted. I just wanted to make sure I had audio. Though he had done his best not to consider the consequences from a selfish perspective, now that the fatal moment was at hand, he could not entirely suppress his own private fears. One small bit of paper might mean the wreck of his career, the upheaval of his life, disgrace in his father's eyes. And, too, there was Edith Gailman, or Gallman, to think of. But if he were to begin excusing his men for some half-formed attachment, not binding, none of them would be left. In any case, he could not imagine excusing himself from this selection for any reason. This was not something he could ask his men to face and avoid himself. A good captain. He handed the bag to Mr. Pollitt and made an effort to stand at his ease and appear unconcerned, clasping his hands loosely behind his back. The surgeon shook the sack in his hand twice thrust his hand in without looking, and drew out a small folded sheet. Lawrence was ashamed to feel a sensation of profound relief when, before the name was read, the sheet was folded over once more than his own entry had been. The emotion lasted only but a moment. Jonathan Carver, Pollitt said. Fanshawe could be heard letting out an explosive breath. Battersea sighing, and Lawrence bowed his head, silently cursing Fanshawe yet again. So promising a young officer, and so likely to be useless in the corpse. Well, there we have it, he said. There was nothing else to be done. Mr. Carver, you are relieved of regular duty until the hatching. You will instead consult with Mr. Pollitt on the process of following for the harnessing. Yes, sir, the boy responded, a little faintly. Dismissed, gentlemen. Mr. Fanshawe, a word with you. And Mr. Riley, you have the deck. 
Riley touched his hat, and the others filed out behind him. Fanshawe stood rigid and pale, hands clasped behind his back, and swallowed his Adam's apple. <laughs> he didn't swallow his Adam's apple. <laughs> and swallowed. His Adam's apple was prominent and bobbed visibly. <laughs> Lawrence made him... <laughs> sorry. Lawrence made him wait, sweating, until his steward had restored the cabin furniture, and then seated himself and glared at him from this position of state, enthroned before the stern windows. Now then, I should like you to explain precisely what you meant by that remark earlier, Mr. Fanshaw, he said. Oh, sir, I didn't mean anything, Fanshaw said. It, w it is only that they say about aviators, sir. He stumbled to a stop under the increasingly militant gleam in Lawrence's eye. I do not give a damn what they say, Mr. Fanshaw, he said icily. Icily. <laughs> England's aviators are, are her shield from the air, as the Navy is by sea. And when you've done half as much as the least of them, you may offer criticism. You will not stand Mr. Carver's watch and do his work as well as your own. And your grog is stopped until further notice. Inform the quartermaster. Dismissed. But despite his words, he paced the cabin after Fanshawe had gone. He had been severe, and rightly so. For it was very unbecoming in the fellow to speak in such a way. And even more to hint that he might be excused for his birth. But it, was uncertainly, sorry, but it was certainly a sacrifice, and his conscience smote him painfully when he thought of the look on Carver's face. His own continued feelings of relief, of relief reproached him. He was condemning the boy to a fate he had not wanted to face himself. He tried to comfort himself with the notion that there was every chance the dragon would turn its nose up at Carver, untrained as he is, and refuse the harness. Then no possible reproach could be made, and he could deliver it for the deliver it for the brownie with an easy conscience, even if it could only be used for breeding. The dragon would still do England a great deal of good, and taking it away from the French was a victory all on its own. Personally, he would be more than content with that as a resolution, though as a matter of duty he meant to do everything in his power to make the other occur. The next week passed uncomfortably. It was impossible not to perceive Carver's anxiety, especially as the week wore on and the armorer's attempt at the harness began to take on a recognizable shape, or the unhappiness of his friends and the men of his gun crew, for he was a popular fellow, and his difficulty with heights was no great secret. Oh, not, not only does he basically have to give up his entire life, if he's got family, he's got to basically ditch him, girl, ditch her, but he's also scared of heights on top of everything, he's be joining the, the aviators. Uh... All right. <laughs> Mr. Pollitt was the, was the only one in good humor, being not very well informed as to the state of the emotions on the ship, and very interested in the harnessing process. He spent a great deal of time inspecting the egg, going so far as to sleep and eat beside the crate in the gun room, much to the distress of the officers who slept there. His snores were penetrating, and their berth was already crowded. Pollitt was entirely unconscious of their silent disapproval, and he kept his vigil until the morning when... With a wretched lack of sympathy, he cheerfully announced that the first cracks had begun to show. All right. Lawrence at once ordered the egg uncreated and brought up to deck. A special cushion had been made for it, out of old sailcloth stuffed with straw. This was placed on a couple of lockers lashed together, and the egg gingerly laid upon it. Mr. Rabson, the armor, Mr. Rabson, the armor, brought up the harness. It was a makeshift affair of leather straps held by dozens of buckles as he had not known enough about the proportions of the dragon to make it exact. He stood waiting with it, off to the side, while Carver positioned himself before the egg. Lawrence ordered the hands to clear the space around the egg to leave more room. Most of them chose to climb into the rigging or onto the roof of the roundhouse, the better, the better to see the process. It was, brilliant, it was a brilliantly sunny day, and perhaps the warmth and light were encouraging to the long-confined hatchling. The egg began to crack more seriously, almost as soon as it was laid out. There was a great deal of fidgeting and noise whispering from up above, which Lawrence chose to ignore, and a few gasps when the first glimpse of movement could be seen inside. A clawed wing tip poked out, talons scrabbling, uh, scrabbling out of the different crack. The end came abruptly. The shell broke almost straight down the middle, and the two halves were flung apart onto the deck, as if by an occupant's impatience. <laughs> The dragonette was left amid bits and pieces, shaking itself out vigorously on a pillow. It was still covered with the slime of the interior, and shone wet and glossy under the sun, 
Its body was pure, untinted black from nose to tail, and a sigh of wonder ran, ran, around, ran throughout the crew as it unfurled its large six-spined wings like a lady's fan, the bottom edge dappled with oval markings in gray and dark glowing blue. Lawrence himself was impressed. He had never seen a hatchling before, though he had been in several fleet actions and witnessed the grown dragons of the corpse striking in support. He did not have the knowledge to identify the breed, but it was certainly an exceedingly rare one. He did not recall ever seeing a black dragon on either side, and it seemed quite large for a fresh hatch creature. That only made the matter more urgent. Mr. Carver, when you are ready, he said. Carver, very pale, stepped toward the creature, holding out his hand, which trembled visibly. Good dragon, he said. The words sounded rather like a question. Nice dragon? <laughs> the dragon had paid him no attention whatsoever. It was occupied in examining itself and picking up bits of shell that had adhered to its side in a, a fastidious way, sort of way. Though it was barely the size of a large dog, the five talons upon each claw were still an inch long and impressive. Carver looked at them anxiously and stopped, at a, stopped an arm's length away. Here he stood waiting dumbly. The dragon continued to ignore him, and presently he cast an anxious look of appeal over his shoulder um, at where Lawrence stood with Mr. Pullet. Perhaps if he were to speak to it again, Mr. Pullet said dubiously. Pray do so, Mr. Carver, Lawrence said. The boy nodded, but even as he turned back, the dragon had forestalled him by climbing down from his cushion and leaping onto the deck past him. Carver turned around with hands still outstretched and an almost comical look of surprise, and the other officers, who had drawn closer to the excitement of the hatching, backed away in alarm. Hold your positions, Lawrence snapped. Mr. Riley, look to the hold. Riley nodded and took up position in front of the opening to prevent the dragonettes going, below, going down below. But the dragonette instead turned to exploring the deck. It flickered out a long, narrow forked tongue as it walked, lightly touching everything in its reach, and looked about itself with every evidence of curiosity and intelligence. Yet it continued to ignore Carver, despite the boy's repeated attempts to catch its attention, and seemed equally uninterested in the other officers, though it did occasionally rear up onto its hind legs to peer at the face more peer at a face more closely. It did as much to examine a pulley, or the hanging hourglass, at which it batted curiously. So pretty much it's just curious about everything right now. It doesn't have any interest other than just checking out his surroundings. Lawrence felt his heart sinking. No one could blame him, precisely. If the dragonette did not show any inclination for an untrained sea officer. But to have a truly rare dragonette caught in the shell go feral would certainly feel like a blow. They had arranged the matter from common knowledge bits and pieces out of Pollitt's books, and from Pollitt's own imperfect imperf recollection of a hatching which he had once observed, now Lawrence feared there was some essential step they had missed. It had certainly seemed strange to him when he learned that the dragonette should be able to begin talking at once, freshly hatched. They had not found anything in the text describing any specific invitation or trick to induce the dragonettes to speak. But he should certainly be blamed, and blame himself if it turned out there had been something omitted. A low buzz of conversation was spreading as the officers and hands felt the moment passing. Soon he, would have to get, soon he would have to give up and take thought to confining the beast, to keep it from flying off after they fed it. Still exploring, the dragon came past him. It sat up on its haunches to look at him inquisitively, and Lawrence gazed down at it in unconcealed sorrow and dismay. It blinked at him. He noticed its eyes were deep blue and slit pupiled, and then it said, Why are you frowning? <laughs> Silence fell at once, and it was only the difficulty that Lawrence kept from gape, uh, gaping at the creature. Carver, who must have been thinking himself reprieved by now, was standing behind the dragon, mouth open. His eyes met Lawrence's with a desperate look, but he drew up his courage and stepped forward, ready to address the dragon once more. Lawrence stared at the dragon at the pale, frightened boy, and then took a, took a deep breath and said to the creature, I beg your pardon. I did not mean to. My name is Will Lawrence. And yours? No discipline could have prevented the murmur of shock which went around the deck. The dragonette did not seem to notice, but puzzled at the question for several moments, and finally said with a dis dissatisfied air, I do not have a name. Lawrence had read over Paulette's books enough to know how he should answer. He asked formally, May I give you one? 
It, or rather he, for the voice was definitely masculine, looked him over again, paused to scratch at an apparently flawless spot on his back. Then he said with unconvincing indifference, If you please. And now Lawrence found himself completely blank. He had not given any real thought to the process of harnessing at all, beyond doing his best to see that it occurred. And he had no idea what an appropriate name might be for a dragon. After an awful moan of panic, his mind somehow linked dragon and ship, and he blurted out, Temeraire, thinking of a noble dreadnought which he had seen launched many years before, that same elegant gliding motion. He cursed himself silently for having nothing thought out, but it had been said, and at least it was an honorable name. After all, he was a navy man, and it was only appropriate. But he paused here in his own thoughts, and stared at the dragonette in mounting horror. Of course he was not a navy man anymore. He could not be. With a dragon, and the moment it accepted the harness from his hands, he would be undone. The dragon, evidently perceiving nothing but of his feelings, said, Temeraire? Yes, my name is Temeraire. He nodded, an odd gesture, with the head bobbing at the end of a long neck, and said more urgently, I am hungry. <laughs> a newly hatched dragon would fly away immediately after being fed, if not restrained. Only if the creature might be persuaded to accept the restraint willingly would he ever be controllable or useful in battle. Rabson was standing by gaping, standing by gaping and appalled, and had not come forward with the harness. Lawrence had to beckon him over. His palms were sweating, and the metal and leather felt slippery as the man put the harness into his hands. He gripped it tightly and said, remembering of, he gripped it tightly and said, remembering at the last moment to use the new name, Temeraire. Would you be so good as to let me put this on you? Then we can make you fast. We, then we can make you fast to the deck here and bring you something to eat. Temeraire inspected the harness which Lawrence held out to him, his flat tongue slipping out to taste it. Very well, he said, and stood expectantly. Resolutely not thinking beyond the immediate task, Lawrence knelt and fumbled with the straps and buckles, care, carefully passing them about the smooth, warm body, keeping well clear of the wings. The broadest band went around the dragon's middle, just, be, just behind the forelegs, and buckled under the belly. This was stitched crosswise to, the, to two thick straps which ran along the dragon's side and across the deep barrel of its chest then back behind the rear legs and underneath the tail. Various smaller loops had been threaded upon the straps to buckle around the legs and the base of the neck and tail to keep the harness in place, and several narrow and thinner bands strapped across his back. The complicated assemblage required some attention, for which Lawrence was grateful. He was able to lose himself in the task. He noted as he worked that the scales were surprisingly soft to the touch, and it occurred to him that the metal edges might bruise. Mr. Rabson, be so good as to bring me some extra sailcloth. We shall, wrap these buck we shall wrap these buckles, he said over his shoulder. Shortly it was all done. Although the harness and white wrapped buckles were ugly against the sleek black body, they did not fit very well, and did not fit very well. But Temeraire made no complaint, nor about having a chain made fast from the harness to a stanchion, and he stretched his neck out eagerly to the tub full of streaming red meat, steaming, not streaming, steaming red meat from the fresh butchered goat, brought out at Lawrence's command. Temeraire was not a clean eater, tearing off large chunks of meat and gulping them down holes, scattering blood and bits of flesh across the deck. He also seemed to enjoy the intestines in particular. Lawrence stood well clear of the carnage, and having observed in, fa observed in faint, faintly queasy wonder for a few moments, was abruptly recalled to the situation by Riley's uncertain, Sir, shall I dismiss the officers? He turned and looked at his lieutenant. Then at, the, then at the staring, dismayed midshipman, no one had spoken or moved since the hatching, which, he realized abruptly, had been less than half an hour ago. The hourglass was just emptying now. It was difficult to believe. Still, still more difficult to fully acknowledge that he was now in a harness. But difficult or not, it had to be faced. Lawrence supposed he could, Lawrence supposed he could cling to his rank until they reached shore. There was no regulations for a situation such as this one. But if he did, a new captain would certainly be put, into his, put into his place when they reached Madeira, and Riley would have never got to get his step up. Lawrence would never again be in a position to do him any good. Mr. Riley, the circumstances are awkward, there is no doubt, he said, stealing himself. He was not going to ruin Riley's career for a cowardly avoidance. But I think for the sake of the ship, I must put her in your hands at once. 
I will need to devote a great deal of my attention to Temeraire now, and I cannot divide it so. Oh, sir, Riley said miserably, but not protesting. Evidently, the idea had occurred to him as well. But his regret was obviously sincere. He had sailed with Lawrence for years, and had come up to lieutenant in his service from a mere midshipmen. They were friends as well as comrades. Let us not be complainers, Tom, Lawrence said more quietly and less formally, given a warm glance to where Temeraire was still glutting himself. Dragon intelligence was a mystery to men who made a study of this subject. He had no idea how much the dragon would hear or understand, but thought it better to avoid the risk of giving offense. Raising his voice a little more, he added, I am sure you will manage her admirably, Captain. Taking a deep breath, he removed his gold epaulets. They were pinned on securely, but he had not been he had not been wealthy when he had first made when he was had first made captain, and he had not forgotten from those days how to shift them easily from one coat to another. Though perhaps it was not entirely proper to give Riley the symbol of rank without confirmation by the admiralty, or yeah, admiralty, not admiralty, admiralty. <laughs> Lawrence felt it necessary to mark the change of command in some visible manner. The left he slipped into his pocket. The right he fixed on Riley's shoulder. Even as a captain, Riley could wear only one until he had three years' seniority. Riley's fair, freckled skin showed every emotion plainly, and he could hardly fail to be happy at the unexpected promotion, despite the circumstances. He flushed up with color and looked as though he wished to speak, but could not find the words. Mr. Wells, Lawrence said, hinting. He meant to do it properly, having begun. The third lieutenant started, then said a little weakly, Huzzah for Captain Riley. That was as weakly as I could say it. <laughs> a cheer went up, ragged, in it, ragged initially, but strong and clear by the third repetition. Riley was a highly competent officer and well-liked, even if it was a shocking situation. When the cheering had died down, Riley, having mastered his embarrassment, added, And huzzah for, for Temeraire, lads. The cheering now was full-throated, if not entirely joyful, and Lawrence shook Riley's hand to conclude the matter. Temeraire had finished eating by this point, and had climbed up onto the locker, onto a locker by the railing to spread his wings in the sun, folding them in and out. But he looked around with interest at hearing his name cheered, and Lawrence went to his side. It was a good excuse to leave Riley to the business of estab establishing his command, and putting the ship back to rights. Why are they making that noise? Temeraire asked, but without waiting for an answer, he rattled the chain. Will you take this off? I would like to go flying now. Lawrence hesitated. The description of the harnessing ceremony in Mr. Pollock's book had provided no further instructions beyond getting the dragon into the harness and talking. He had somehow assumed that the dragon would simply stay where it was without further argument. If you do not mind, perhaps let us leave it a while longer, he said, tempor temporizing. We are rather far from land, you see, and if you were to fly off, you might not find your way back. <laughs> oh, said Temeraire, craning his long neck over the railing. The Reliant was making some whereabouts eight knots in a fi fine westerly wind, and the w water churned away in the white froth from her sides. Where are we? We are at sea. Lawrence settled down beside him on the locker. In the Atlantic, perhaps two weeks from shore? Ma Masterson. Er, Masterson? <laughs> he added, catching the attention of one of the idle hands who were not very subtly hanging about to gawk. Be so good as to fetch me a bucket of water and some rags, if you please. These being brought, he endeavored to clean away the traces of the messy meal from the glossy black hide. Temeraire submitted with evident pleasure to being wiped down, and after appreciatively rubbing the side of his head against Lawrence's hand, Lawrence found himself smiling involuntarily and stroking the warm black hide, and Temeraire settled down, tucked his head into Lawrence's lap, and went to sleep. Sir, Riley said, coming up quietly. I will leave you the cabin. It would scarcely make sense otherwise. With him, meaning Temeraire. Shall I have someone help you carry him below now? Thank you, Tom. And no, I am comfortable enough here for the moment. Best not to stir him unless necessary, I should think. Lawrence said, then belatedly thought that it might not might make it easier on Riley having his former captain sitting on deck. Still, he was not inclined to shift the sleeping dragonette, and added only, if you would be so kind as to have someone bring me a book, perhaps one of Mr. Pollitt's, I should be much obliged, thinking this would both serve to occupy him and keep him from seeming too much of an, too much an observer. Temer did not wake until the sun was slipping below the horizon. 
Lawrence was nodding over his book, which described dragon habits in such a way as to make them seem as exciting as plotting cows. Temeraire nudged his cheek with a blunt ro- sorry, a blunt nose to rouse him, and announced, I am hungry again. Lawrence had already begun re- reassessing the ship's supply before the hatching. Now he had to revise once again as he watched Temeraire devour the remainder of the goat and two ha- hastily sacrificed chickens, bones and all. So far, in two feedings, the dragonette had consumed his body weight in food. He appeared already somewhat larger and was looking about far, or looking about for more with a wistful air. One second. <coughs> Whew. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> Lawrence had a quiet and an anxious consultation with Riley and the ship's cook. If necessary, they could hail the Amity and draw upon their stores because her compliment had been so badly reduced by her or by her series of disasters. Her supplies of food were more than she would need to make Madeira. However, she had been down to salt pork and salt beef, and the Reliant was scarcely better off. At this rate, Temeraire should eat up the fresh supplies within a week, and Lawrence had no idea if a dragon would eat cured meat, or if the salt would perhaps not be good for it. Would he take fish, the cook suggested? I have a lovely little tunny caught fresh this morning, or toony, (laughs) uh, caught fresh this morning, sir. I meant it for your dinner. Oh, that is, he paused awkwardly looking back and forth between his former captain and his new. By all means, let us make the attempt, if you think this is right, sir, Riley said, looking at Lawrence and ignoring the cook's confusion. Thank you, Captain, Lawrence said. We may as well offer it to him. I suppose he can tell us if he does not care for it. Temeraire looked at the fish dubiously, then nibbled. Shortly, the entire thing from head to tail had vanished down his throat and had been a full 12 pounds. He licked his chops and said, It is very crunchy, but I like it well enough. Then startled them and himself by belching loudly. (coughs) I gotta remember for these streams to bring water with me. Ah. Well, Lawrence said, reaching for the cleaning rag again. That is certainly encouraging, Captain. If you could see your way to putting a few men on fishing duty, perhaps we may preserve the ox for a few days more. He took Temeraire down to the cabin afterwards. The latter presented a bit of bit of a problem, and in the end of the and in the end, the dragon had to be swung down by an arrangement of pulleys attached to his harness. Temeraire nosed around the desk and chair inquisitively, and poked his head out of the windows to look at the Reli- Reliance wake. The pillow from the hatching had been placed on into a double wide hanging cot form. Slung next to Lawrence's own, and he or slung next to Lawrence's own, and he leapt easily into it from the ground. His eyes almost immediately closed to drowsy slits. Thus, relieved of duty and no longer under the eyes of the crew, Lawrence sat down with a thump in his chair and stared at the sleeping dragon, as at as at an instrument of doom. He had two brothers and three nephews standing between himself and his father's estate, and his own capital was invested in the funds requiring no great management on his part. That at least would not be a matter of difficulty. He had gone over the rails a score of times or he had gone over the rails a score of times in battle, and he could stand in the tops in a gale without a bit of queasiness. He did not fear he would prove shy aboard a dragon. But for the rest, he was a gentleman and a gentleman's son. Though he had gone to sea at the age of twelve, he had been fortunate enough to serve aboard a aboard first, or second re- yeah, or second-rate ships of the line for the most part of his service, under wealthy captains who kept fine tables and entertained their officers regularly. He dearly loved society, conversation, dancing, and friendly, friendly whist were his favorite pursuits. And when he thought that he might never go to the opera again, he felt a very palpable urge to tip the laden cot out of the windows. He tried not to hear his father's voice in his head, condemning him for a fool. Tried not to imagine what Edith would think when he, she heard it. He could not even write to let her know. Although he had to some extent considered himself a com- committee, no formal engagement had ever been entered upon. Due first to his lack of capital, and more recently to his long absence from England. So, if you're watching now and you don't really know why he's kind of... Re- not reluctant, but not looking forward to, you know, joining the Air Force. He was a Navy captain where as a captain of the Navy, you can kind of still have a life outside of the Navy. When you join the Air Force, or essentially the Aerial Force, or whatever they call it here, you kind of have to stay away from society. You are basically meant to stay with your dragon and stay with the Air Force. You're 
life is that place now. And even when you're retired or whatever, you kind of have to live away from everybody. You know, so your dragon can freely roam without causing issues. So he's kind of basically giving up his life to do this, but he doesn't really have a choice. Okay. He had done sufficiently well in the way of prize money to do away with the first problem. And if he had been set ashore for any length of time in the last four years, he most likely would have spoken. He had been half in mind to request a brief leave for England at the end of this cruise. It was hard to deliberately put himself ashore when he could not rely upon getting another ship afterwards. But he was not so eligible a prospect that he imagined she would wait for him over all other suitors on the strength of half-joking agreement between a 13-year-old boy and a 9-year-old girl. Now he was a poor prospect indeed. He had not the slightest notion how and where he might live as an aviator, or what sort of home he could offer a wife. Her family might object, even if she herself did not. Certainly it was nothing she had been led to expect. A Navy wife might have to face the equan okay, equanimity her husband's frequent absences, but when he appeared she did not have to uproot herself and go live in some remote covert with a dragon outside her door and crowd of rough men, um, the only society. Did I skip something there? <laughs> he had always entertained a certain private longing for a home of his own. Imagined in detail through the long, lonely nights at sea, smaller by necessity than the one in which he had been raised, yet still elegant, kept by a wife whom he could trust with the management of their affairs and their children both, a comfortable refuge when he was at home, and a warm memory while at sea. Every feeling uh, pro protested against the sacrifice of this dream, yet under the circumstances he was not even sure he could honorable honorably make Edith an offer which she might feel obligated to accept. And there was no question of courting someone else in her place. No woman of sense and character would deliberately engage her affections on an aviator, unless she was of the sort who preferred to have a complacent and absent husband leaving his purse in her hands, and to live apart from him while, even while he was in England. Such an arrangement did not appeal to Lawrence in the slightest. The sleeping dragon swaying back and forth in his cot, tail twitching unconsciously in time with some alien dream, was a very poor substitute for hearth and home. Lawrence stood and went to the stern windows, looking over the Reliance Wake, a pale and up opalescent froth streaming out behind her in the light from the lanterns. The ebb and flow was pleasantly numbing to watch. His steward, Giles, brought, him, brought in his dinner with a great clatter of plate and silver, keeping well back from the dragon's cot. His hands trembled as he laid out the service. Lawrence dismissed him once the meal was served and sighed a little when he had gone. He had thought of asking Giles to come along with him, as he supposed even an aviator might have a servant. But there was no use if the man was spooked by the creatures. It would have been something to it would have been something to have a familiar face. Oh, sorry. In solitude he ate his simple dinner quickly. It was only salt beef with a little glazing of wine and the fish had gone into Temerary's belly, and he had little appetite in any case. He tried to write some letters afterwards, but it was no use. His mind would wander back into gloomy paths, and he had, no, and he had to force his attention to every line. At last, he gave it up, looked out briefly to tell Giles he would, no, he would take no supper this evening, and climbed into his own cot. Temerary shifted and snuggled deeper within the bedding. After a brief struggle with unchar uncharitable resentment, Lawrence reached out and covered him with, covered him more securely, the night air being somewhat cool, and then fell asleep to the sound of the dragon's regular deep breathing, like the heaving of the bellows. And that was chapter one, and we'll continue chapter two in the next stream probably. Um, yeah, so this is His Majesty's Dragon. I really enjoy this book. Again, as uh, you can probably tell, it's kind of a, if you caught a bit of the beginning of it. It's like a fantasy mixed with a little bit of history based on like Napoleon Bonaparte's time. He is in the, was it English Navy? <laughs> um, and they took over a French ship. Or was it a British ship? I have mistracked. I was focused on trying to get everything read and out correctly. But uh, they uh, one of the things they got on that ship was a dragon egg and it imprinted on him. And he's kind of giving up his life to become an aviator, essentially, with this dragon he named Temerar. Um, so yeah, on Thursday we'll continue with Chapter 2, but I'm excited about this, and I hope everyone else is as well.
I really enjoy this book. But at that, um, I'm going to end it here. Like I said, I'll be back on Thursday. Tomorrow I'll be doing Pokemon Platinum. And uh, if I ever get more viewers at some point, we can take time to talk about it. But uh, as for now, we'll just keep on reading and keep on chugging along. So uh, if you catch on for tomorrow's stream, I'll see you then. If uh, not, hopefully I'll see you Thursday for Chapter 2. You guys have a great evening. Bye-bye.